Hello everyone this is part 10 of what if Naruto was in Anbu at 6, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Naruto openly stared at the sight, it had to be a trick, some kind of illusion or ninjutsu or something. There was no possible way that he could be seeing this. He moved to stand but a pulsing pain from the seal on his stomach stopped him. He felt a rush and when he opened his eyes again he found himself standing in front of the Kitsune's cage, a sight that he hadn't seen in many years. But the sight that greeted him was even more surprising than the view on the outside world. The doors to the seal were open, albeit slightly but still open nonetheless. Within the cage Naruto could see a massive pool or lake of red chakra as it glowed fiercely. But he couldn't see the fox. Looking for something. Naruto turned and took a step back in true, genuine fear as a red fox the size of a very large horse grinned at him before it lunged forward and bit his shoulder. Naruto closed his eyes, waiting for the pain, but when none came he opened his eyes revealing that the fox was actually clamping down on his shoulder, but not injuring him. The fox chuckled at his expression of wariness before it pulled back and began circling him. Don't worry fool boy, I cannot harm you, for now at least. How are you out of your prison? Naruto asked the kitsune, his hand resting on the sword at his side. The kubi smirked, its pearl white fangs glinting evilly. That would be your doing fool boy, well, you and that girl. Naruto glared at him. What have you done? He snarled as his eyes flashed red. The legendary demon smirked, I have decided to take my leave of this dull, boring place and go into my second prison. Second prison. Naruto repeated angrily. The fox sneered at him, placing his face right in front of the blonde. You did not seriously believe that one lonesome child barely out of his mother's womb could hold my full power back did you? Don't flatter yourself boy. That yondime of yours could never hope to design a seal strong enough to have a child survive receiving my near limitless chakra. He split your power in two. Naruto said quickly deducing what the kitsune was getting at. The fox's smile was almost prideful yet somehow hateful all the same. That he did, my consciousness, and five tails of my power into you, and four tails into her. Naruto was quiet for a long moment before he snarled and grabbed the kitsune by the front of his throat, Kyubi growled, at this point he couldn't harm his vessel, but the blonde could apparently harm him. The legendary beast could practically feel Naruto's smirk as he spoke in a smug tone. It matters not you cursed creature. From what I can tell, this part of you is just your consciousness, and that. He said jerking his head to the pool of red chakra still within the cage. Is still your five tails of power trapped in the seal. I still have all your strength, so go to her. Go to the foolish girl. I'll be glad to rid the world of both of you. At this the QB smirked and chuckled the dark foreboding sound still as chilling as ever. Ah, but here lies the Yondime's one true folly. He paused as he laughed again. He designed both seals with the intent that nothing would ever change. But one thing will change now, the location of my conscious mind. Naruto's narrowed eyes could tell he was not going to enjoy this. The Yondime designed your seal with my self-preservation instincts in mind. He knew that I would not want to die, and so knew, that I would always do my best to control the damage my chakra did to your body, in order to preserve my own life. However, now that I will no longer be here, your body will experience the full damage the use of my chakra will undoubtedly provide you with. Naruto narrowed his eyes and then tore out the kitsune's throat, only to have him burst into red mist and reform a few feet away. Oh but Naruto there is so much more to this. It chuckled. The girl's seal is designed differently, she pulls out less chakra than what you would normally do, but the damage is automatically filtered by her seal, but now, with my entering her seal, I can refine the chakra even further, making it do even less damage than what it used to do to you. She will have my power while you, you will experience more pain than what you could ever imagine calling just one tail. Naruto glowered at the kitsune, his form shaking in rage as he glared with all the hate he could muster. QB smirked. Then, when I use her to kill you, the chakra in this seal will automatically seek me out, entering her, and thus killing her, releasing me from her seal, since it was never meant to bind my spirit. While your seal is, therefore this seal, 
Dot not hers would take me to the afterlife with you. Quote. Why did you not owe this sooner? You could have easily escaped the seal any time, if this was always the situation. Still so very astute. The QB smirked. That blasted Sandime hid her well, so well that not even I could sense her, but when you attacked those Hugo you two cross paths, her close proximity to both you and my chakra, awoke the chakra I had within her, she has been a beacon ever since, I just needed to wait for her rage to get the better of her. Now then my boy. He gave a mock bow as his form began to fade. I take my leave of you. He said chuckling at his enraged eyes. Naruto immediately found himself in the outside world and snarled his eyes practically glowing crimson before he attempted to suppress the fox's chakra only for the burning pain around his seal to intensify nearly ten times over, he realized that the blasted fox did indeed make it easier to control. He grit his teeth and tried as hard as he could to suppress the chakra, barely managing to drop it from two tails to a single tail's worth. He groaned but ignored the pain as best he could, he only had one tail worth of the fox's chakra but felt as if he was getting three tails worth of pain. He snarled and rolled back his sleeve and saw to his great, displeasure, to put it mildly, that damage was being done faster than what it could be healed. He hissed when his metal gauntlets and face mask began to burn, he removed them quickly, letting them drop with a hiss to the grassy floor where they continued to let out smoke. He clutched his head in pain, the chakra fought ravenously against the seal. It held strong but the pain was almost unbearable. It felt as if his entire body had been dipped in molten steel. He tried to suppress the chakra again but it fought back with a viciousness he had rarely encountered before with anyone or anything he had faced. Soon it landed, and looked to her blonde companion in silent shock before she forced herself to snap out of it, she could ask questions later. She turned back to her opponent, who was now getting to his feet. She rushed him, never once hesitating in her stride. Naruto turned at the sound of her footsteps, he ignored the intense pain of the QB's chakra and got to his feet. He blocked her attacks as best he could but the pain was impossible to ignore even for him. Sunid's assault was relentless but he managed to hold his ground if just barely. Finally he found an opening in her assault and unsheathed his last remaining sword and slashed the woman across the stomach, it began to heal but just then the purple seals that covered her faded and receded back into the diamond on her forehead. She faltered for a moment and Naruto took the opportunity and formed another Raisingan in his hand, but, with Kyuubi's chakra interfering he couldn't fully complete the last stage and instead slammed an imperfect Raisingan into her stomach. Soon it skidded back several yards before coming to a stop, numerous lacerations covered her arms, legs, upper torso, all giving a spiral-like design around one gaping hole in her stomach. She fell to her knees and coughed up blood. She gritted her teeth and focused her healing chakra. Naruto moved to attack but suddenly his chakra flared up. The Kyuubi's chakra had sensed the blood and was now fighting against the seal. It spiked to the point where it would have been the equivalent to three tails once more, the haze of red chakra around him was now a massive fog-like cloud. A vicious blood-curdling roar of pain escaped his throat as he fell to his knees in agony. He looked to his uncovered hand and saw the skin practically falling away, revealing muscle and tissue beneath. The chakra was going to kill him before soon it could. He tried to stand but only succeeded in getting to one knee. Blood seeped from his mouth, eyes and ears, dripping to the floor. He snarled through his teeth and stood as he glared at Sunid. The woman panted as her healing was finally done and looked into his blood-red eyes. Even now, blood covered and consumed in red chakra as he was she could see the message in his gaze clearly. I will not fail. You will not stop me. Akina growled as she saw Naruto exchange blows with Sunid. She rushed forward intent on attacking him as well when a fist hit her right across the jaw knocking her down to the floor, she rolled once and got back to her feet. She snarled at the now one-eyed man as he took his stance holding his one good arm in front of him. Your opponent is me. He spoke with a cold hard gaze. She snarled before she rushed him, her clawed hands slashing with animalistic fervor. Her attacks were wild and crazed, her speed had nearly quadrupled from what it was and the wild nature of her attacks was making it increasingly difficult to block or dodge. Finally she overextended herself and the Kirinin grabbed her wrist before he heaved her over his shoulder and slammed her into the ground, he didn't release his grip and began spinning round and round until he finally released her, tossing her into a tree. 
As she stood he saw her eyes flash and a faint glow came from beneath her clothing around her stomach before she extended her claw and the red chakra claw shot out towards him. He was surprised but managed to swerve out of the way in time to avoid it, only to see the claw sink itself into a tree a few yards behind him. It groaned in protest, he snapped his head back to the girl but turned it back to the tree and felt his remaining eye go wide as the tree was now coming towards him. The claw dragging it back. He practically dropped to the floor, narrowly avoiding it as it passed overhead. He then rolled to the side just as she slammed the tree down where he was like a giant, bushy club. Inside of her mind her thoughts were slowly shifting, where before her thoughts were of stopping Naruto or Guan from hurting Shizun and Sunid, now they merely craved for blood. A sinister voice spoke to her, asking her to give in, to feel the warm blood of her enemies flow through her fingers, and feel it as it ran down her throat. From his new and hopefully temporary residence the QB smirked. He couldn't give her any more power with the restrictive seal she held but it was enough for now, soon he would weaken the seal enough so she could use all four of the tails she held in her. Then, he would destroy that blasted boy. He formed his hand seals as best he could with his injured arm, it hurt terribly and only through the use of chakra did he even manage to move it in time. Luckily, his finger muscles worked fine, otherwise he would have been in a lot of trouble. The green-clad man exploded from the ground right in front of her. Her eyes widened for a brief moment before she slashed at him with her free claw. Her claw screeched against his chest armor, the heavy plating managing to deflect the blow if only just. He moved with impressive speeds and before the girl could do much more than scream he stabbed her four times in her upper torso, with one slash across her hip, where her artery was located and another slash to her left arm, no doubt causing nerve damage. She growled as she fell to her knees seething as she gritted her teeth. Her blood flowed freely, pulling at her feet before the injuries healed. She looked let her eyes travel to the man who now stood above her with a kunai raised ready to kill her. She glared defiantly into his remaining eye. Before he could bring his blade down on her Shizun ran up behind him and locked her arm with his, stopping him cold. Akina's eyes flashed before she delivered an upward swing with her claws, which this time did cut through the armor and left three long gashes along his chest, they weren't deep but they did hurt. He then kicked the blonde girl in the chest, using her to push back and land on top of Shizun. He rolled back, managing to escape her grip and got to his feet before he kicked her in the ribs, sending her skidding across the ground. He then raised his forearm above his head blocking Akina's downward strike. He then swerved to the right to avoid her follow-up before he elbowed her in the stomach. She stumbled back and sneered before she rushed him again. Her form little more than a blur of red. Guan took up his fighting stance again but before the girl reached him a blur of white appeared in front of him and nailed her right in the face, knocking her down next to Shizun. Guan looked and found that it was the man Naruto had called Jiraiya, one of the Sanan he noted. The silver-haired Sanan's movements were jerky and uncalculated, meaning that he was still recovering from whatever soon it had done to him. Jiraiya turned to him. You deal with Shizun, I'll stop this one. Guan nodded as he eyed the dark-haired woman as she stood. Soon it grunted in pain as she was thrown harshly against a tree. She couldn't even move before he was upon her, snarling slashing and kicking. She could barely keep up and every now and then some of his attacks would get through, covering her in numerous slashes. His attacks, before were powerful and refined, a routine he had done numerous times and it showed. But now, now his attacks were almost desperate, wild and untamed, he truly looked like the demon many thought him to be. Finally, the woman had enough and elbowed the three behind her, knocking it down, and leapt back. She took to the trees, Naruto close behind her. She then leapt down and with a flying kick, tore down another tree which she quickly grabbed and used it as a bat, sending Naruto flying back over the treetops. The Jinchuriki snarled before he extended his right hand snakes came from the sleeve and grabbed one of the overhead branches. He pulled himself back like a slingshot. His left claw reared. Sunid sighed in relief but snapped her head up as she heard the breaking of branches and rustling of leaves, just in time to see Naruto explode from the top of the trees, a trail of red chakra behind him. She reared back the tree in her hands and threw it to him like a spear only to have the blonde extend the snakes in his wrist to pull himself above the tree's path. He ran along the side of the massive projectile before he lunged at her again. She rolled to the side to avoid a claw swipe. It left three jagged claw marks on the ground in its wake. She moved to kick him but the blonde grabbed her leg, 
He skidded a few inches in the ground but dug his heels in and took the hit. She gaped at him, she didn't even hear his bones crack as they had done with the few other times he had been forced to block her hits. He snarled before he twisted her leg harshly, and didn't stop until he heard her scream of anger and pain and the snapping of bones. Soon it turned and placed her hands on the ground before spinning around completely and kicked the back of the blonde's head, sending him tumbling forward. Naruto snarled as he got to his feet. The slug Sanon had already reset the bone back into place and was applying her healing chakra on it when he rushed her again. Soon it waited for him to get close and stood she used her broken foot and she kicked him in the throat. The blonde coughed and heaved but soon it took this chance to get some distance between the two of them. He snarled and ran after her, ignoring the pain that shot up his legs from his bones and protesting muscles. His chakra flared up again, nearly making him stumble from his perch, but he caught himself and did his best to ignore the pain. He caught sight of the slug Sanon, her leg had apparently broken again. He lunged at her, intending on killing her once and for all so he could concentrate on suppressing this wild chakra. But, when he had already closed half the distance between them she turned, the sword he had dropped when his chakra had first flared firmly in her hand. He tried to change his trajectory with his wind chakra but again the Kyuubi's chakra, combined with the pain made it near impossible, and he was only able to change his trajectory so that she would run the blade through his right shoulder instead of his heart. His claws flashed before she felt a searing pain against her abdomen. Her blood seeped through his clawed fingers and down his right arm, she was amazed that he could still use it with a sword through his shoulder, but she did her best to avert her eyes from the sight. She reared her fist back and brought it down on his head, Naruto used his other arm to block and felt his knees buckle as her monstrous strength made itself known again. A scream of pain was heard off to the sidelines and the two immediately snapped their heads in the direction in time to see the last of the Kyuubi's chakra dissipate from around Akina as Jiraiya held his hand against her stomach, apparently having used a five-point seal. Soon it cursed as she saw Shizun was losing her fight with the injured Miss Nin badly, one of her arms appeared to be broken and she was favoring her right leg. She reared her leg back and swung with all her might. Naruto tried to put up a defense but her attack broke through with ease and nailed him right in the jaw, sending him flying back. S-H-I-Z-U-N-E. Soon it called as she ran towards them. The dark-haired medic blew out some more poison gas, making Guan back off to avoid it before she ran, both women heading towards their last comrade. Jiraiya formed his hand seals to form his swamp of the underworld technique. Sunad, seeing her ex-teammate's intentions leaned down and picked up a large stone, not even slowing down in her run before she threw it at him. Jiraiya narrowly avoided the attack, but the two-second diversion was enough for Sunad to dive for the girl, placing a hand on her shoulder as Shizun gripped Sunad's other hand. Sunad and Jiraiya's eyes met. She noticed something. The pervert was holding the last hand seal. She met his eyes again for the briefest of instants, a silent thank you on her lips before they vanished in a swirl of leaves. Jiraiya stared at the spot the three females had vanished for a few seconds before he heard another scream, one of rage and pain. He turned and felt his eyes go wide as he saw Naruto on his knees clutching the seal as red chakra floated all around him. He couldn't see many injuries but the fact that the boy had screamed at all was cause of worry. Both he and Guan rushed to the boy's side. Jiraiya skidded to a halt next to him. Naruto what's wrong? The blonde grabbed him by the throat as his eyes flashed red. He looked to the silver-haired man, and snarled through the pain. The seal, cut off, the, chakra. Jiraiya, knowing now was time to question the boy pushed him onto his back, cut open his shirt and formed his hand seals. Gogyo Fuin. He yelled slamming his seal over the existing one. Immediately the red chakra receded and Naruto visibly relaxed. His entire body was covered in second and third degree burns. Guan was the one who spoke up. That chakra the girl used is similar to yours, what happened? Naruto stood ignoring the pain and spoke. I will explain later but first Jiraiya, I need you to fix my seal. Guan, gather a team, I want those three found. You have two days. He spoke before he straightened and began making his way back to the village promising that the next time he met the slug Sanon or the girl that traveled with her he would take great pleasure in removing their heads from their shoulders. Two weeks, two weeks since his encounter with the slug Sanon. The blonde Jinchuriki was now sorting through various files in his office. They held the name and picture of every ninja in Kanoa's records from Chunin and below. 
he had returned to Kanoa just a week after the encounter, practically storming through the halls in silent fury. He left Kakashi, Shibi and Kuranai there and simply told them to handle the situation as they saw fit. Shino and Hanata had returned with him and Jiraiya. He gave another angry look at the gold braces now wrapped around the wrists of his gauntlets. Jiraiya had given them to him just a few days after he arrived back in Kanoa and he explained the apparent workings of this seal. From what you explained to me about what's happening with the seal this is probably the best solution I can come up with. Naruto looked to the golden bands before he picked one up and examined it. What does it do? He questioned turning his eyes onto him. Wipe your blood over it and focus your chakra. He said simply. Naruto removed one of his gauntlets cut his finger over the edges of the other, wiped it on the gold band and focused his chakra. The blood over the two gold wrist braces was immediately absorbed into five individual seals on each band, making ten in total. These are basically chakra blockers of sorts. They'll hold back the QB's chakra enough so it doesn't hurt you, but not enough to mess up your chakra control. He paused for a moment before he continued. Each seal can also be released at any time, you just need to wipe your blood over one of the seals and say Kai in order to do so, removing two of the seals should be equivalent to one tail, but I truly don't recommend you using it. Since you were unable to do anything about the damaging effects of the chakra weren't you? Naruto said, quickly deducing the reason for the man's warnings. Jiraiya sighed and shook his head. No, I don't know of any seal that could suppress the damage demon chakra causes to a human body. Minato obviously knew of one based on what the QB told you since that's apparently what he did with the girl. But as you know all of his research and the Horatian scroll were destroyed in the fire of his home caused by the fox. Naruto nodded and looked at the gold wristbands. So in essence, unless I bring back the QB's conscious mind into the seal and find a way to keep him in there then the chakra will always be unstable when I use it. Jiraiya nodded. Yeah. He sighed and rubbed his forehead. It's turned now into a double-edged sword, the physical boosts are still as impressive, if not more so without the QB's restrictions, but the pain and long-term damage it can cause you can make you lose the fight anyway. Naruto looked pensive for a moment before he snapped the wristbands on his gauntlets. Remove the five-point seal. He ordered. Jiraiya nodded as both ninja stood. He formed his hand seals, letting the blue flames glow on the tips of his fingers for a moment before he slammed them into Naruto's stomach. The boy grunted and straightened as he felt the small traces of Kyuubi's chakra once again begin to flow through his system. Still, he could tell that the chakra in him was much wilder than before. It didn't cause him pain, but it was still a constant, harsh reminder that he now had to guard enemies from both outside, and within himself. He stood before turning to Jiraiya. Now, I want you to personally search through Sarutobi-sama's personal records, whatever happened he most likely did not want me or anyone else to find it, you are the only person currently alive who is better at seals than he was. Find me something. He ground out as he glared at the white-haired ninja with cold blue eyes. Jiraiya nodded before he turned and left the office. Naruto sighed and rubbed his head, throwing the folder onto the desk he leaned back in his chair, he was getting a migraine, something he almost never did get. He looked out the window to view the village of Kanoa, there was still a tension in the air, something heavy and oppressive. He sighed again before he donned his cloak and mask and made his way out the door, he needed a walk or something to clear his head. Akina's eyes subtly shifted from the back of Sunid's head, to the floor. A tense silence was oppressive around the three of them. Sunid hadn't even spoken to her Shizun would send looks of both pity, suspicion and a little bit of fear every now and then. She scarcely remembered the fight, she remembered fighting against the guy in green, Guan she remembered was his name. Then she had taken the sword and gone to destroy the thing. But decided to hide it instead since it would take way too much chakra to melt the thing and had rushed back. Then she remembered seeing him standing over Shizun, after that, some things started becoming hazy for her, she remembered being angry and having attacked him, then, she remembered, red, almost like, fire, and a voice, a dark voice, telling her, calling for blood, telling her to destroy, everything, then, nothing. She had woken up to an interrogation. She groaned as she sat up from her laying position, rubbing her sore head. She didn't have time to even open her eyes before she felt someone wrap an arm around her collar and jerked her to her feet before slamming her against a wooden wall. Sunid Sama. She heard Shizun's startled voice. 
She opened her eyes only to find Sunid's angry brown ones glaring at her. What? She began but stopped as Sunid slammed her against the wall again knocking the wind right out of her. Shut up. Sunid commanded as she narrowed her eyes. I'm the one that's going to be asking questions. She growled. Now I want the whole truth. Just what the fuck was that back there? She shifted under the woman's grip uncomfortably. I don't remember. She gasped out as her grip tightened around her collar, beginning to cut off her air supply. Soon it narrowed her eyes before she turned the girl around and struck a point in the back of her head followed by two more points at her temples and two more at her forehead and the base of her neck. Now tell me, what was it that you did to get that chakra yesterday? I don't know what you're talking about. The young girl said again as she struggled in her grip. Sunid's eyes again narrowed, she had pressed three points which would make it damn near impossible for a non-medic to lie and she doubted that QB could interfere, with the seal Jiraiya had placed on her to block it out. What day were you born? She questioned. October 15th. Just five days after the QB attack. This is too convenient. She does fit the right age, I wonder. Before Akina could fully understand what the hell was wrong with the older blonde woman Sunid dropped her and turned sharply on her heel. Come on both of you, we're going to go see an old friend of mine. Akina regained herself before she straightened and looked to the back of the slug Sanon's head. Wait, just what the hell was that all about? Suna didn't say anything before she exited the hut. She soon spared the younger girl a look of sympathy before she turned to follow her mentor. Akina looked down to the floor before she straightened and two began following the two medics. That was just over a week ago days ago and still soon it wouldn't speak to her. It was quickly getting on her nerves, but something told her to hold her tongue and be patient. She looked back at Sunid as she walked ahead of them. She didn't understand, but she hoped that the slug Sanon would start talking soon. This accusing silence was driving her nuts. Are you certain of that? Came the voice of the newly elected Kazekage as he rounded back onto the form of his messengers his brother Kankuro, and his sister Temari flanking him as he addressed the man. There is no doubt about it. The ninja spoke as he bowed. Kiri has somehow been conquered by Kanoa, Hitaki Kakashi, Abarain Shibi and Yuhi Kurunai are acting as Junin commanders for the region. The fact that they have not declared a cage is clear reason to believe that the three are still loyal to Kanoa. Gara placed a hand to his chin in thought, his eyes were wide with disbelief, yet one could see the cogs of his mind moving to evaluate the situation. This makes no sense, how could anyone conquer a nation overnight without even a hint of knowledge reaching us beforehand? Baki spoke up as he too began to see the implications of what this could mean. If this Uzumaki boy could conquer Kiri, weakened as it was, this quickly then he must be extremely powerful. Anyone with that kind of power shouldn't be taken lightly. If he chose to attack Suna next, then they might very well too be conquered. Gara began pacing around for a while. Kiri was a land that almost every nation had set their eyes on. Nearly 20 years of civil war had practically bled them white and everyone realized that with the way things were going, by the end of it Kiri would barely have enough strength to stand on its own two feet, let alone fend off another village like Suna, Iwa, Kanoa, or Kumo. But that meant, that at this very moment Kumo and Iwa were most likely receiving word as well, and knowing their fierce hatred for Kanoa, the two nations would no doubt jump at the chance to attack the Leaf Village. But, he was not about to make the mistake of underestimating Kanoa's Jinchuriki again. If he was able to take an entire nation right from under the noses of not one, but three hidden villages, then there was a chance that he would also win against Kumo and Iwa if they even chose to combine forces. If he joined Kanoa, then there was little doubt Kanoa would win, if he joined Iwa and Kumo, then there was absolutely no chance in the seven hells that Kanoa's Jinchuriki could prevail. He didn't care how strong he was. But then that would open the door wide for Iwa and Kumo, neither of which was friends with Suna, especially Iwa. And with their military weakened from the failed attack on Kanoa. The village elders must be informed, assemble the council. He stated, for he knew that this was one decision that he could never make on his own, it was a decision that carried the fate of their whole world. My lord, came the general response as they bowed and left to gather the elders. Village of Awagakur, Suchikij residence. Many Junins laughed around a table, a celebration of some sort was being held. It appeared to be something small, nothing too extravagant considering the location it was being held in. Hey, look at him Toyohisa. 
One man said as he gestured to the party goers, there were about 50 to 60 people all around the area, including men, women and children of all ages both ninja and civilian alike as they laughed and enjoyed themselves in a general sense. They seem to be happy here don't they? Why don't you join them? You've had your eyes set on that. For Tava girl for a while now she's not taking to anyone at the moment, so now's your chance. The man that spoke, was Yoshihiro Shimazu, god I'm Suchikij of Awagaku. He was quite large, almost 6 feet, or at least 5'11 with Chuzu's build. He was in his mid to late 50s but appeared to be in his early 40s, only his grey hair revealed his age, it was cropped back in a loose ponytail. He had tanned skin with an almost reddish hue. He sported a handlebar moustache. The man he had called Toyohisa laughed nervously as he scratched the back of his head somewhat sheepishly, a blush staining his cheeks. He was an ordinary looking young man, black hair, gentle look, slim build and a kind smile. He could be no older than 20. Uncle, please. He whispered in embarrassment. Yoshihiro barked out a laugh, the sound coming out gruff yet like that of an old friend sharing a joke. Boy, let me tell you, in a world like ours you only have one chance at everything. So stop beating around the bush and go. The young man sighed before he smiled and got up. He began making his way to the crowd but paused as he noticed his uncle wasn't following him. Uncle, you're not coming. Yoshihiro dismissed him with a wave of his hand. No no, this kind of setting isn't for me, I do it for you younguns. My place is on the battlefield, that's the only place for me. His nephew sighed tiredly. Always have to be the devil Shimazu. The older man smiled before he stood. I'll show you a real devil if you don't hurry up. Toyohisa smirked before he made his way through the crowd, soon vanishing among the mass. Yoshihiro smirked before he turned and left the main hall, into another room of the manor. All right, what is it now? He spoke without even pausing in his stride. An Anbu appeared next to him, already keeping pace. My lord Yoshihiro, there is some news that might interest you. He stated handing the man a scroll. Yoshihiro took it and unrolled the document. He read over it before a smile formed on his features and he tossed the scroll back. Double the patrols around our borders and assign men to start building up our defenses. The Iwa Anbu bowed. As you wish Suchikij Sama. He stated before vanishing in a puff of smoke. Yoshihiro slid open the screen door at the end of the hallway and entered the candlelit room before he closed the door behind him. Inside was a thick set of purple armor, a large battle axe was held above it on a stand. He walked over and fingered the armor. Satisfaction comes first, he muttered before smirking. It looks like you and I will be going into battle again, I can't wait, I'll make sure Kanoa remembers the name of Devil Shimazu, he said to himself with an amused chuckle before he turned and left the room. Village of Kumogakur, Rakage Residence. I see. Thank you, you may go, came the calm voice of a man with white robes who sat with his knees bent under him as he calmly sipped his tea. The messenger bowed once before he turned and left the room as requested. The man currently sipping his tea wore white robes, simple yet elegant, long raven black hair went down to his lower back. He had a neatly trimmed moustache and goatee and a calm, placid look, yet somehow held an underlying warmth to it. On the shoulders of his robes held the symbols of yin and yang, he wore a simple black headband which kept his hair out of his eyes. The man continued to sip his tea, apparently unaffected by the news his messenger had brought. I know that look, came a voice behind him. He turned looking over his shoulder, he caught sight of a woman. She had shoulder-length brown hair, held together by a gold headpiece. It resembled a crown but was designed to look like a falcon. She had green eyes which spoke of experience, both on and off the battlefield, as well as great intelligence. Whatever do you mean my lovely wife? He questioned calmly as he stood and turned to walk past her to the garden outside. The woman huffed in mild annoyance. I mean, that you have barely even heard whatever you heard three seconds ago and you're already up to your tiresome tricks again. Let us not forget, my dear Yue Ying, that it's these so-called, tiresome tricks, that brought us together in the first place. Zhu Liang, she spoke in that dangerous tone only wives can use effectively. I am warning you, that you will be very displeased if I continue my actions which despite your protests I will. Therefore your warnings are a moot point. She glared for a moment before she huffed airily and left the black-haired man to his own devices. 
The newly named Juge calmly walked over to a koi pond and began feeding the brightly colored fish. Now then Uzumaki Naruto, what will your next move be, I wonder? It was many hours later, in the dead of night, that said blonde Jinchuriki was again sitting at his office shifting through files. He was finally on his last one. But as he reached the final page, it proved that this too held no information of this mystery girl. He growled, the sound escaping him before he could rein it in. 177 files, over 6,000 papers, nearly 200 genins graduated in the last decade or so, and not one goddamned clue on who, in the seven fiery hells of the earth, this girl was. He was broken from his thoughts as the door to his office opened revealing a very nervous-looking toad hermit, holding a single thin file under his arm. His cold blue eyes traveled up to his. You found something. He nodded running a hand through his hair, a nervous gesture. Oh yeah, I found something. He muttered tossing the file on the desk. A bright red sticker which read, classified, was on the top. Naruto also noticed several seals written over the file. Eight in total, some even he didn't know about. No doubt Sarutobi had wanted to keep this girl a well-guarded secret. Who only Jiraiya, if anyone could discover. He had succeeded. He opened the file, revealing a picture of the girl, smiling. Name. Roguzetsu Akina. Rank. Genin graduated at age 10. Date of birth, October 10th. Biological parents, deceased. Legal guardians Roguzetsu Nobutsa, Roguzetsu Yuriko. Relation, daughter by legal adoption. Status of parents or guardians, ninja on paid leave. Current ninja status, Genin on reserves list. Biological relatives still alive, brother. She has a brother. He mused before he looked to the name written next to it. Jiraiya only had time to hear sounds of paper sliding onto the floor before. What? Jiraiya licked his dry lips as Naruto snapped his eyes to meet him. Jiraiya could see them glowing faintly beneath the hood, flashing from blue to faint purple as the gold braces on his wrist hissed and glowed with the seals as they struggled to hold back the chakra within him. The blonde visibly reigned in his temper before he continued. I want an explanation Jiraiya. The toad hermit sighed, half in relief that the blonde had calmed down and half to prepare himself for the upcoming explanation. He searched in his kabuki robes and removed an old brown book, the pages worn with age. This is Sensei's diary. He explained here, that, when your father sealed the demon into you, he also sealed it into Akina, or more specifically, your twin sister. He paused as he saw Naruto's shoulder tense and a small growl reached his ears. He obviously needed to explain how Arashi defeated the Kyubi. Many in the council were seasoned shinobi, all familiar with the legends of the Bayou. They would never believe that any jutsu used by just one man other than a sealing technique could have stopped him. However, since he knew that there was a very real possibility that they would not follow Arashi's last wish, he decided, that since you were the firstborn, as well as the one who held the majority of Kyubi's power and also the one that most had seen, that he would present you as the sole container for the demon. When he realized that they would indeed ignore Arashi's last wish he sent her away with two of his most trusted ninja, programmed a new identity and date of birth five days after the Kyubi attack, along with a new social security, birth records, everything. He made sure that absolutely no one but himself and the two ninja he assigned as her parents would ever know about her being the second container. Her adopted parents trained her, she graduated at nine, as you saw in the profile, and was placed on the reserve list since no team could take her in without throwing the balance off. She attempted her first Chunin exam just six months before you, Hanata and Sasuke took yours and apparently made it to the finals. She was going to pass but Sarutobi pulled it back at the last minute, not wanting her to have to take on Chunin level missions before she was absolutely ready. Her sensei didn't nominate her for the next Chunin exam so she did not take it with you and your team. Well, you already know the rest. He finished. A heavy silence filled the room and the toad sage could practically hear the cogs in Naruto's mind clicking into place. Finally, he saw the blonde straighten and school his features, obscured by the mask as they were. Though Jiraiya could still see the seals on his wristbands glowing faintly, indicating that he was still very much angry. The toad hermit stared straight into Naruto's eyes. What will you do? He asked somewhat nervously. This changes nothing. She dies. He spoke simply as he walked around the toad hermit and began leaving the office. You. Would kill her. Even now after you know who she truly is. 
The toad hermit questioned Waver in his voice as he hesitated. Naruto paused before he passed through the door and looked back over his shoulder at the white-haired ninja. Jiraiya, he spoke slowly. I have not come this far by bowing down to the whims of conscience, I suggest you get used to that. He said before he turned and walked out of the office, the wooden door closing shut behind him. Sunagakur, Council Chamber. The Council Chamber of Sunagakur could only be described by one word at this moment. Chaos. Various yells and shouts of nearly 200 councilmen created an orchestra just right for a migraine and sore throat. As expected, news of Kiri's apparent conquest had caught everyone off guard and most in Suna's shinobi council had been thrown into panic. There was a division between three. Attack, an alliance, and neutrality. Many in the council who favored to take down Kanoa's Jinchuriki immediately, made valid points. That they could defeat him now while he was still within military, economic and their tactically sound field was the main and most important point. Of course things were never that simple. That course of action was very risky. If they did attack now, after their recent loss in the short Oto, Suna, Kanoa War, then there was a definite, almost certain chance that they would lose if Iwa or Kumo did not attack with them. Privately, Gara himself was hesitant to attack the Kanoa Jinchuriki. He had spared his life after all, there was a debt between them. And he had little doubt as to who would lose in that fight as well. Kanoa's demon was simply beyond his skill right now. The other option, an alliance, was foolish, because then Naruto would take advantage of that alliance and request their assistance in his wars, thus weakening them and in the long run, if he defeated Kumo and Iwa, would be able to seize Suna as well. And if he was beaten by Kumo and Iwa, Suna would be on the losing side. A loose-loose situation no matter what. The final option, neutrality, was meant to wait and see if both Kumo and Iwa attacked Kanoa, that way, with Suna's involvement the leaf would lose for certain. While this might seem the safest course, this plan also held a great risk, if he was able to conquer either Kumo or Iwa like he conquered Kiri, practically from one day to the next, then Suna would have no choice other than to surrender. Still, this would be an act of war, it was not something for a cage to choose on his own. The young Kazekage sighed, this was a horrible situation. The whole nation was at this point, on the very edge of a power struggle that could escalate into the largest war this world had ever witnessed. And all because of one Jinchuriki. Kirigakur, Training Ground 22. Guan entered the training field and found Ginchiko. Her back was to him as she practiced her kata with her blade. Bandages were still wrapped around her, and small stains of red could be seen on them, as well as her heavy breathing. All indications that she should not be out of the hospital. He walked behind her, intent on ceasing her training before she injured herself further. She suddenly spun around sword already swinging but he had been expecting it, having seen the kata many times over. So he calmly brought up his arm, which held a small metal arm bracker which he used to block her blade with a loud resounding clang of steel against steel. She gasped, and the unexpected resistance nearly knocked the blade right out of her grip. Gu Guan, what in the... I believe, he interrupted calmly as he lowered his arm, that you were not due for your release from the medical ward for at least another week. She scoffed, as she fixed her grip on the sword again. I can't stay there or lose my mind. Now if you, what the hell happened to your eye? She asked, only now noticing the new patch covering the wound. He raised his hand and absently rubbed the spot around his eye. Two talented girls, I was careless and they were stronger than I anticipated. She looked at him incredulously for a moment before she spoke. It's not like you to underestimate anyone. She then shrugged before she turned to leave again. Ginchiko. Guan called her retreating form. Have you decided on your allegiance in this war? Have you? She questioned a little harshly. There was a pause that Guan did not bother to break, waiting for her to eventually fill the silence. Are you really going to stay with him? Guan nodded. Yes, he spoke solemnly yet fiercely. She took a deep breath as she looked up to the sky. Then I suppose, I'm with him too then. She then turned and smirked at him. After all, someone has to make sure you don't lose your last eye. She taunted before walking off. Guan smirked before he made his leave in the opposite direction. And as he made his way through the village, that they had been fighting for so fiercely, he could not help but recall his brother. Hidetada, my brother, though I may have failed you in life, I swear I will do everything within my power to fulfill your dream in your stead. 
Mika growled as she lazily tossed kunai, hitting the bull's eye repeatedly with a hard, thunk, sound as she pulled the kunai back with a wire. Unite the land, that's no good, then I can't kill any more. Thunk. If he unites the land, then the chaos will end. Thunk. And if the chaos ends. Thunk. Then my fun ends. Thunk. And we can't have that now can we? Sunagako, Market District. Inazuka Kiba promptly spit out the contents in his mouth, which consisted of a fried eel, rice, and some green peppers all over one Narashikamaru as he rounded on the Suna Kunoiki sitting next to him. What? Are you serious? Temari nodded, ignoring Shikamaru's indignant sputtering as he wiped all the crap that had landed on him. Yeah, supposedly, that guy's already conquered Kiri. Gara's meeting right now with the council to decide on what course of action we should take. Isn't it obvious? He yelled standing up catching the attention of the other patrons. You need to go and kick his ass now that he's weak. Kiba. Shikamaru cut in sternly. There are a lot of risks with that plan. If we were to attack now, then Iwa, who is also a rival of Suna would simply wait it out for us to destroy each other and then would take both territories with little resistance. If we were to wait for Kumo or Iwa to make a move, then we also risk being consumed in the power vacuum that would occur upon Kanoa's defeat, and, because of Suna's recent defeat during the Chunin exam, we barely have the numbers to take on a fully functional village like Kumo and Iwa, attacking him at all could lead to Suna's downfall, and even though I want that guy dead as much as you I'm not willing to destroy Suna in order to get it. Kiba and Temari both stared at Shikamaru, one in anger yet acceptance that he was correct, the other in slight amazement. He had analyzed the situation and had explained some risks that even she and Gara hadn't thought of. Temari sighed before she stood. Look, as of right now this is top secret, no one under Junin knows about it, I just told you out of courtesy. Tell your friends but make sure they don't tell anyone else. As of now, Suna could be moving to war very very soon. Kanoa, Market District. I love you guys, came the slurred voice of the female member of the Sound 4. She was currently dead drunk and hanging off the arm of one of her teammates, namely the bone user Kimimuro, who could apparently handle his sake much better than she could. The five were currently sitting in a little ramen stand named Ichiraku Ramen. Meanwhile, Jirabu and Kidomaru were staring at this, unbelievable sight in almost slack-jawed fascination. Hey Kidomaru. Yeah Jirabu. A slight pause which was broken by Tayuya giggling like a little school girl. I. What am I seeing? I don't know Jirabu, I just don't know. Saken blinked several times as he stared at the bottle of sake as if it was a new form of poison, or a miracle cure. Damn. This shit must be good. He muttered before he began chugging it down like his life depended on it. Kimimuro eyed the girl clinging to him and shrugged. They do say sake makes one act strange. Tayuya giggled and suddenly appeared between two severely freaked out Jirabu and Kidomaru as she placed her arms around them. You guys are the best team Mathis any kuni, kumo, ninja girl could ask for. She slurred as she smiled up at him, not noticing, or perhaps simply oblivious to the terror-ridden expressions on their faces. She giggled and looked over out of the stand. She looked but then pointed and happily squealed. Look, it's the creepy guy with the mask. The other four occupants craned their heads back in order to see who she was pointing at. When they did they each paled to some degree and turned back around very fast. Jirabu, Kidomaru and Saken went as far to hide behind the menu while Kimimaru settled for simply sipping his sake. Ichiraku walked out from the back room, wanting to see what all the commotion was about. What he found was one drunk kunoiki, a somewhat nervous-looking Kimimuro and three very nervous-looking idiots hiding behind one menu sheet. He then looked out and found the source of their nervousness. It was a cloaked individual wearing a metal face mask. Ichiraku couldn't see his face but he didn't have to. The slight sag of shoulders, heavy steps with no destination, resolutely staring ahead and nowhere else and the invisible weight he appeared to be carrying on his back told him that this was a person with a lot on his mind. So without further ado he spoke. Hey buddy. He yelled making Naruto and the currently coherent members of the Sound 4, er 5, swivel their heads to look at him. With the attention of his target firmly set on him he waved him over. You look like you got problems, a good bowl of ramen will do ya some good. I do not believe that will be necessary, Naruto replied before he began walking away again. Come on. Ichiraku called again. First one's on me eh? 
You look like someone who has not had ramen in a long while. It'll do ya some good. He grinned. Naruto paused in his stride and looked to the sky. How long had it been since he had ramen? Had he ever had it? He couldn't remember. Ichiraku couldn't help but smile as the cloaked individual turned towards the shop. The entire sound team just wanted to melt into the wall and floor at the moment. It was a healthy respect they had for this individual, as well as a good amount of fear since he single-handedly wiped out the Hyuga clan. Orokimaru had often said that the Hyuga clan was the only thing in Kanoa that was any real threat to him. To defeat more than half of them on your own was nothing short of monstrous. So they were obviously less than pleased when Tayuya giggled, giving away the position as Naruto entered the stand. He looked to them, his blue eyes faintly shining beneath his hood as they reflected the light that got to them. He gave them a nod before he continued his walk to one of the stools and sat down. It was soon after that Naruto found a full and steaming bowl of ramen in front of him. He silently lowered his hood and began removing his face mask. The Sound 5 watched with almost bated breath, even Tayuya seemed to have sobered up, they had never really seen his face, only a brief glimpse of his blonde hair when they had been waiting on the roof of the council room for the planned overthrow of said council. Finally he removed his mask and set it down on the bar. While Tayuya had to stop herself from outwardly gaping at his features her comrades could only notice one thing. He's younger than all of us. He snapped his chopsticks and took a bite. He swallowed and then looked at the grinning Ichiraku. This, he spoke slowly, is very good. Ichiraku only chuckled in response. Naruto's small moment of peace was broken however as a tune and entered the stand. Naruto-sama. A messenger has arrived from the northwest garrison. He says it is urgent. Naruto nodded before he stood and put his mask back on. He placed some money on the counter but was stopped by the chefs. Hey I said the first one's on the house. Tell you what, take a rain check and come by next time, there'll be a bowl here waiting for ya. Naruto slowly nodded and placed his money back in his pocket before he followed the Chunin back to the Hokage Tower. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.